Yeah. He was having an improper sexual relationship with some of the young men who were supposed to be like he had a group and he was mentoring them. And as he traveled around the country and the world, he would take them with him. And they would go to these hotel rooms and he was having sexual relations with them. I believe it. Why would you claim that you were sexually molested by Bishop Eddie Long and you were not? You Some will say money, okay. You're right. You're right about that. Money is a powerful motivator. Uh, let me continue with Edwards Flow. He writes, uh, a pastor, a teacher, a close family friend, an uncle, and sometimes it's kids that may be four or five years older than the one that they are victimizing. It's a cycle. One must have a strong mind to deal with. It is a cycle. So the first thing I'm thinking about Africa Bombada is he must have been abused. He must have been abused himself. Some of these teachers, these female teachers, I'm wondering if they were abused. That, ladies, you tell me. If, when you were 24, 25, and be honest with me, were you attracted to young boys who were 16, 14, 15? There's been cases of married women in their 30s, mid-30s, married with children. And they start sexual relationships with boys who are teenagers. What is that all about? I mean, is it because the husband ain't hitting it right? Is it because they just, they, they realize this wasn't the life that they wanted? What, what is it? Were they molested as children? You tell me. T uh, Tiffany writes, uh, as Medea would say, peace be still. Keep a peacemaker for these predators. I'm telling you, you, if you mess with the wrong person's child, your life is on a line. You might as well get ready. Kita Kita writes, yes, those who attended that school like myself knew about Mr. D. He was not the only sicko there. Really? See, I had no idea. I was there for like three years. I had no idea. Maybe I was there for too short a time. And I was very, very young, like third grade to sixth grade, something like that. Brittany writes, I'm with you on that, Tracy. Tracy writes, my kids don't even travel alone with their coaches. Nope, sorry. Sad to say, but that's right. That's absolutely right. So again, check out the video for yourself. It is on my Facebook page, if you are so inclined to do so. It is made available for you right now. Jerica writes, I've been a child abuse investigator for over 12 years. You'd be amazed by who these sexual perps are. Be aware. Great flow, Nate. Jerica, good to see you. Good morning. Do you remember that show, To Catch a Predator? What was it, a Chris Hansen? That was a great show. I mean, it really was eye-opening to a lot of parents and just people in general. You cannot judge a book by its cover. Okay, you can't judge a book by its cover. You know, when you think a sexual predator is not some dude with a trench coat on exposing himself at the park, it's the guy with the suit on in the position with the his name on the door. Who loves kids? Oh, I love the children. I bet you do. I bet you do. That's why I say, you know, all this sagging jeans. Oh, pull your pants up, man. Listen, the real predators out here aren't necessarily these young boys sagging their jeans. So what? The biggest gangsters in American history never sag their pants at all. Robbing people blind. <laughs> The Daryl writes, sexual predators are sometimes family members. Unfortunately, sometimes they are. Unfortunately, sometimes they are. Very, very sad out there. And again, if you know someone who comes to you and they say that they were victimized, take it seriously. Take it seriously. Fully investigate it. Got a family member, they come forward. Have that kind of relationship with your child or the young people in your life, nieces and nephews, where when they tell you something, don't overblow it. Don't go over the board with it. Because what will happen is, from a child's perspective, it's like, well, damn it. I can't really tell them anything. I'm not going to say anything. Now, how does that serve you? Let me move on here. I want to remind you of something very, very quickly. This is the 911 call from Ronald Ritchie. I want to play this one more time. We played it several, several weeks ago. Uh, I read the words of the special prosecutor uh, who was put in place up in Beaver Creek. Uh, how is it that the judge says that there's probable cause to charge Mr. Ronald Ritchie, but then a special prosecutor says that basically it was ridiculous to charge Mr. Ronald Ritchie with anything? Because 
he could not ascertain as to whether Mr. Ronald Ritchie was, was purposely lying. And I thought to myself, why don't we listen to this again? Okay. This is Ronald Ritchie's infamous 911 call, uh, 2014. And he called the police in Beaver Creek. And because Mr. Um, <laughs> it was very, very sad because there was a black man in his opinion who was waving a gun at the Walmart in Beaver Creek. Now, we know that this man was never waving the gun at anyone. There is not one witness who has come forward to say that a gun was ever pointed at them. And you know, and I know that if someone had pointed a gun at a child, then the parents would have come forward to say, yeah, it was my child. We were in aisle 24. Okay. And this man was waving the gun and he pointed right in my son's face. That has not happened. So it's very clear to me that Mr. Ronald Ritchie was lying, period. But uh, let's take another listen to this, shall we? Beaver Creek 911, where's your emergency? I'm at the uh, Beaver Creek Walmart, sir. The uh, gentleman walking around with a gun in the store. Is he got it pulled out? Yeah, he's like pointing at people. What does he look like? He's a black male, probably about six foot tall. Okay. What's he wearing? Um, blue shirt, blue pants. Where is he at now? He's over in the pet. Can I have your name, please? My name is Ronald Ritchie. Ronald? Yes. He's like loading it right now. All right, Mr. Ritchie, hold on one second, okay? Not a problem. I'm still on the phone with you. This is Fairborn, but they're gonna—they're probably sending somebody. Okay. So I'm just gonna stay on the phone with you. Okay. Hello. What's he doing now? He looks like he's just trying to load it. He's just trying to load it. Yeah. Confirm. Okay. Is he—he's still in the pets area. Yeah. Okay. What's he loading it with? Do you see? I have no idea. I'm not getting that close okay, to him. Okay, that's fine. Is he got people that he's pointing it around now? Um, I can't tell if there's anybody he's pointing it at right now, but it looks okay. like he's like aiming at things. Okay. I'm just gonna keep you on the phone until they get back on there. Okay. You're fine. Okay, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Where is he at now? Yeah. He's still in the pet section. Just looks like I don't know what he's trying to do. He's just like pointing at me. 2023. This is Sherry Warren. I'm still online. Do you guys need any help? Affirmative, maybe. He's in the pet section. Beaver Creek? Yes. It's fair one. Do you guys need any help that way? Not yet. Okay. Thank I'm you. Staying on the line. I let my sergeant know just in case. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh -huh. Okay, sir. Tell me what's going on now. Um, I don't know what he's doing. He's just like looking around, waving it, waving it back and forth. Waving okay. it back. Sir, and what forth. type of gun is it? Is it a shotgun or is it a handgun? It looks like a rifle. It's a BB gun, idiot. What color? Is it black. The black white rifle. Yeah. All right. You said you saw him put loaded. He looks like he was trying to load it. I don't know. Lies. Affirmative. I have a gentleman who's watching him. Says he's waving hey, it around. Horses. Believes it's a rifle. Believes he just put some bullets inside. Man, the Crawford family should fire him and kick his ass, period. I have an officer there. You have an officer here? I also have another officer on scene. He's in the back corner of pets right now. Nine. White male, black male. They're advising black. he's in the black male. Back corner yeah. of pets. He's a black male. What's he wearing? Uh, black shirt and blue jeans. All right, no, enough of this man's lies. I can't take it anymore. And that's very, very tough, very difficult to, to listen to. Uh, so many lies. The special prosecutor 
claims that there is no evidence that Mr. Ritchie knew that he was lying. What? Even though we all know that the very next day in a separate interview, he contradicted his original statements that he had made on that 911 call we just played for you. He went from saying that he was waving it around, pointing it at people, which means the business end. And then the very next day in a separate interview, he said, well, he was just flashing the muzzle. That's a big difference, Mr. Ritchie. If Mr. Crawford III was such a threat, why is it that, that uh, there was only one 911 call made that day? Only one. Did you know that? There was one 911 call that was made that day, and it was made by Mr. Ronald Ritchie. If he was such a menace, speaking about Mr. John Crawford III, why didn't other individuals call 911? Because he wasn't a menace, folk. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Let it let G.O.D. handle it. But if I was on the jury, let's say the Crawford family caught up with Mr. Ronald Ritchie. I'll put it this way. Because I don't want to feel like that I'm inciting any violence. Because I'm not. I believe in natural law. If the Crawford family caught up with Mr. Ronald Ritchie and kicked his A, and I was on the jury, I would be very sympathetic. I'd be very sympathetic. And the race has nothing to do with it. If you flip this race of it, it makes no difference whatsoever. There are some things that you do and there are some things that you don't. What in the hell is this special prosecutor talking about? What is he talking about? Mr. Pipe Meyer. Yeah, he's been around Ohio. We'll talk about his history in a minute. Did you know that the special prosecutor, the man who on Monday claiming that Mr. Ronald Ritchie, we're not going to go after any charges, is the same man who was in charge of the prosecution of the Beaver Creek officers? How did that happen? How is it that the same prosecutor who decided not to pile charges against the officers at Beaver Creek, how is he also the same person who's going to ascertain whether Ronald Ritchie did anything wrong? As I told you before yesterday, I told you this yesterday, folks, I believe that Mr. Pipemeyer became came to this conclusion, not because of Mr. Ronald Ritchie, but because of the officers involved. They just don't want to open up this case anymore. They want to keep it closed. They don't want to expose the officers or the officer who shot, who fired. That's what I think. This is just my personal opinion. Everyone's entitled to it. You cannot tell me that Ronald Ritchie is not guilty of inducing panic. Okay? That's like saying, uh, yelling fire in a crowded theater, right? And somebody gets trampled to death because people are trampling out. And then when the police talk to him, he says, well, I smell smoke. You smell smoke? What? Well, he thought he saw, he said he smelled smoke and there was some people smelling mar smoking marijuana uh, two rows in front of him, so we can't ascertain as to whether he lied or not. What? Something needs to be done. I'm telling you, that's a travesty. This is an example of how black lives don't matter. This is an example of how black lives don't matter. Because if Mr. John Crawford III's life mattered, Ronald Ritchie and his actions would have been taken more seriously by the prosecution up in Beaver Creek, period. This is Pipe Meyer. These are the words that are being attributed to him in local media. Uh, quote, the original call was basically, I'm at the Beaver Creek Walmart and there's a man walking around with a gun in a store. The remainder of his questions was mostly answers in response to questions from the dispatcher. That is not true. His statement was that there was a black man waving and pointing a gun at people, including children at the Beaver Creek Walmart. That's a big difference, Mr. Pipe Meyer. There's a huge difference. Why is Pipe Meyer covering for Ronald Ritchie? He's not. He's covering for the officers that were involved. Because here's the thing, even though Ronald Ritchie in my heart and in my head, I believe is culpable because he set up the scenario. Those officers did not take the proper time to ascertain as to whether John Crawford III was actually a threat. They overreacted on the scene. They're police officers. That's why you have training. 
That's why you have training to.